always ready. Okay, so it's a hard act to follow. Courtney sure knows what she's doing when she talks about working with live witnesses. But this morning, we're going to turn our attention to FERPA, issues around confidentiality and other record issues. Yes, this says June 2022. Those of you who were at um, Sugarloaf have already heard this presentation, but you have an annual requirement for folks to be up to speed in FERPA land. And so we're going to talk about it again this morning. As with all CDS related things, FAPECAT is a part of this presentation because FAPECAT thinks that confidentiality is extremely important. Frankly, I don't understand a darn thing he says. In this next hour, we're going to cover FERPA. We're going to talk about the interplay between FERPA and IDEA. And we're going to touch on some other confidentiality or student records issues. Same rule as with the last session. As a lawyer, I will talk until I'm interrupted. So if Jennifer, Roberta, if you all keep an eye on questions, I'm happy to be stopped at any time. So let's start with the very basic. What is FERPA? FERPA stands for the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act of 1974. It's been amended over time, but many would argue not enough. If you think back to 1974, what types of records were they worried about? Mimeographs. They were worried about handwritten documents. They were worried about forms that were literally handwritten. There was no ability to fill them in on a computer. And they were worried about copies of typed documents that had copy paper inserted in them. This was an important piece of civil rights legislation that was enacted to protect the privacy rights of students and their parents. Essentially, there are four main purposes behind FERPA. Giving parents the right to their students' education records, giving parents the right to request the school correct records, which they believe are inaccurate or misleading, protecting parents and students' right to privacy by limiting transferability of education records without their consent, and finally, allowing parents to file a complaint with the United States Department of Education if they believe that a school is violating FERPA. Whose FERPA rights are they? Parents have the right until the student turns 18 or is attending an institution of post-secondary education. Given that your charges leave CDS at school age five, I think it's safe to say that the only folks' rights that we're talking about here are the parents' rights. If you have a five-year-old who is attending an institution of post-secondary education, please let me know because that will be truly remarkable. Who is bound by FERPA? An educational agency or institution that receives federal funds under any program administered by the US Secretary of Education. So what does that mean? Well, all public schools receive funds from the Secretary of Education. Many, but not all private schools receive funds from the Secretary of Education. And of course, CDS, which receives special education money from the Secretary of Education. Just to be clear, CDS receives money from the Secretary of Education, and that means you need to require that your contractors comply with FERPA. So in other words, it doesn't mean only CDS on its own, you include in contracts with your contractors that they have to follow FERPA. So what does that mean for people? Well, officers and directors like the CDS state director, the Part C coordinator, CDS employees, and like I just said, CDS's contractors. 
including your faithful attorney. What is protected? First of all, education records. Now, education records is a very, very, very broad category. Look at this definition. It contains information directly relating to a student and is maintained by the educational agency or institution or a party acting for the agency or institution. Very, very broad. A lot of you have heard me say, when you get medical records, reports from doctors, they become protected under FERPA when they're in the possession of CDS. Because look at the definition, it contains information directly related to a student and it's maintained by CDS. The fact that in other contexts, it would be a medical record doesn't mean it's outside of FERPA when it's in the hands of CDS. The other thing that's protected is personally identifiable information that's contained in education records. So in other words, if the information that you have is from the education record, you can't go using it outside of FERPA just because you're using it apart from the record that it came with. What makes something personally identifiable? Well, obviously a name, the name of a student's parents or family members, addresses of the student or their family, personal identifiers like a social security number or an ID number. I understand that your sync system assigns student numbers to students, so that would be personally identifiable. A list of personal characteristics that would make the student's identity easily traceable and any other information that would make the student's identity easily traceable. So let's pause right here. We need to agree on one thing. The fact that a student is enrolled, is attending, is participating in CDS programming makes the information personally identifiable. Because what is that telling you about the student? It's telling you they're a student with a disability. So unlike a public school that can publish what's called directory information, the names of the students that attend, for example, CDS can't because a list of the names of the students that are attending a CDS site or a CDS program by definition contains another piece of information that they're students with disabilities. So physical description, a child's race, sex, appearance, the date and place where a child is born, religion, national origin, all of this is easily traceable. But the bottom line is identification as a student with a disability makes it traceable. The other thing that you should know is that when CDS at the state level releases data or information about the CDS system as a whole, the release of very small numbers of aggregate or statistical information might have to be blocked or redacted because that small number of children might reveal personally identifiable information. So how is this information protected? First of all, parents, we won't talk about students right now because your students are all too young to have FERPA rights, have the right to inspect and review education records within a reasonable period of time Schools are not required to provide copies of records unless requiring parents to come to the school to review the records would effectively prevent access. And schools can charge a fee for copies unless the fee would essentially prevent the access. Now, put a pin in that because under IDEA, you're required to provide that information to the parents anyway. So CDS doesn't charge for providing special education records to parents because they're entitled to them under IDEA, but not FERPA. 
the parent may request that the school correct or amend the record. So inaccurate or misleading is the standard, but that's more than because the parent disagrees. Example, CDS gets an OT eval for student X. Parent does not agree with what the OT evaluator found about student X. That disagreement does not mean that the record is inaccurate or misleading. It stays in the child's file. Now the parent is entitled to a hearing on its request that the school correct or amend a record. And if the hearing officer finds in the school's favor, the parent can still put a statement with the student record saying why they disagree with it. This shouldn't be a big surprise to you because of course under IDEA, parents are allowed to tell you both verbally and or orally and in writing all the time when they disagree. Just another opportunity. IDEA hearing officers don't resolve FERPA disputes. <coughs> the hearing under FERPA is different than a due process hearing under IDEA. Parents have the right to consent to disclosure. That consent has to be informed written consent, which means that the parent needs to understand what the school intends to disclose, to whom, and what the purpose and scope of the disclosure will be. There are a number of exceptions to consent. The most common one is to teachers or district officials with quote, a legitimate educational interest. In other words, CDS can share education records with other folks on the IEP team, with other folks at the site level, because these are officials with a legitimate educational interest. Officials of another school system or school where the student seeks or intends to enroll. That's how you can share information with the preschools when you place a child in a non-CDS preschool. That's how you share information with the school administrative unit where the student resides when it's time to do transition planning. Another exception is to authorized representatives of federal and state education authorities. That's the exception under which CDS provides student information to the state CDS office, the Department of Education, the main Department of Education, and in some cases, the United States Department of Education as part of annual compliance reviews, monitoring, that sort of thing. In connection with a health or safety emergency, well, I'm just gonna say it, that's what the post-biting disclosure is. If you need to tell a parent who bit their child so that that parent can have information necessary to treat the bite, this is the exception. Finally, like we talked about last hour, you can provide documents, education records without consent in response to a lawfully issued subpoena. That's why, well, that's one of the reasons why, anytime you get a subpoena, it goes to the state office and it's reviewed by me. I'm checking to make sure that you can disclose the documents or information because it's a lawfully issued subpoena. <coughs> Finally, if a parent wants to file a complaint, they can contact the United States Department of Education, and here's their actual physical address and phone number. What happens if you accidentally disclose FERPA-related materials? Well, the court has told us, and by the court I mean the Supreme Court, that there is no private right of action under FERPA. That's fancy lawyer language for a person can't sue you, Jane Doe versus CDS, in order to claim that their FERPA rights were violated. As you know, 
there are plenty of opportunities for parents to bring due process hearings under IDEA, which might ultimately end up in court. And it's possible that in that due process hearing or in court, records issues under IDEA might be a part of it. But you cannot go to court and simply say, I want relief because my FERPA rights were violated. If there's a wrongful disclosure, a parent can complain to the US Department of Education. The US Department will investigate. They'll attempt to resolve through voluntary compliance. If that doesn't happen, they'll make findings and direct a compliance plan. In the worst case scenario, they could withhold federal funds after a hearing. They've never withheld federal funds from anybody. Okay. The Uninterrupted Scholars Act, with that fabulous acronym of USA, has amended FERPA in a way that also impacts IDEA. It allows for non-consensual disclosure, in other words, you don't need parent consent of education records to representatives of a state, local, or Indian child welfare agency legally responsible for the care or protection of the student. This is the exception that allows you to provide education records to DHHS or to an Indian child welfare agency caseworker without the parent's consent. It also permits disclosure pursuant to a judicial order without any additional notice to parents in certain types of judicial proceedings. It means that we could get served with an order that requires you to produce documents and not tell the parents. So let's talk about how FERPA and IDEA work together and are different. One issue, who is the parent? Under FERPA, a parent is a natural parent, a guardian, or an individual acting as a parent in the absence of a parent or guardian. That's a very broad category. And it's often something where you have to exercise discretion in terms of figuring out whether this is an individual who's acting as a parent in the absence of a parent or guardian. The most common example, children who find themselves with grandparents. In other words, the parent has left or is not available. The child is with the grandparent, but there have been no formal court proceedings to nominate or make the parent, the, the grandparent, the guardian. IDEA includes another term, surrogate parent. A person who is not the parent under IDEA may still have rights under FERPA. So even if a parent is not the parent under IDEA, because for example, the student is in custody and a surrogate parent, state custody, has been appointed, those parents still retain their rights under FERPA. It's not enough to have a child in custody to remove a parent's right under FERPA. The second important thing to know is that representatives of DHHS do not have any of the rights of a parent under IDEA. In no case can a representative of DHHS exercise parental rights. What about prospective providers and Sarah, places? Sorry yes. to interrupt, but uh, can you go back to a slide? Because the question we often get is, uh, um, what do I tell the DHHS ca case manager? And that is an often uh, a question because um, they act as if they are parents, but I, I just, it, it's one of those things that yeah. um, happens very, very frequently. So um, because they're not a parent, um, again, what, it, what should be the response when asked by the DHHS uh, case manager for certain information? 
So here's what's important to remember. They're entitled to information in the child's education records under the Uninterrupted Scholars Act, okay? Non-consensual disclosure of educational records to representatives of a state, local, or Indian child welfare agency legally responsible for the care and protection of the student. There's a difference between entitled to information. Under MUSER, they're entitled to be present at IEP or IFSP team meetings. That's not the same as having the rights of the parent. What are the big rights of the parent? That's where I want you to go. To consent to initial evaluation, to consent to the IEP, to consent to placement, to exercise any of the, of the procedural safeguards, if they want mediation, if they want to do process hearing, to ask for an independent educational evaluation, an IEE. In other words, those are the moves that only a parent can make. What does the DHHS official get, the caseworker? They get copies of education records. They can ask you questions about the education records. They can attend the IEP team meetings, but they don't get to be the parent. Sarah, yep. this is Sherry Jo. I have a yep. question. My question is, when we when referrals come in, when we develop an IEP, we have a form, it's called authorization to share information. That would be like any case manager these parents may have, and I'm using example, like Morrison, um, Walbian, if there's a speech therapist, are going to be a speech therapist. Should we have authorization to share information and put DHS on these forms too. Roberta's okay. saying no. Roberta's aggressively shaking her head no. I see that. So. I'm glad I never did it. Okay, Roberta, I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Roberta is right. DHHS is entitled to this information without consent because of what I talked about before under USA. You are right to have the private case management agencies because it's oftentimes too confusing to figure out. Sometimes the private case management agencies are caseworkers on behalf of CDS and uh, on DHHS and sometimes they aren't. Generally speaking, I would include the private case management agencies. And if we ever have a situation where DHHS is telling us XYZ agency is the caseworker for purposes of sharing with the DHHS caseworker. We'll handle that when the time comes. But DHHS itself, no release. Correct. Um, and, and I just want to just remind everyone, you know, DHHS case managers, they're, they're, they're they don't know what they don't know. And they might just say, oh, I'll give consent. They don't, like Sarah said, they don't have the right. And there are so many new DHHS case managers. They just may not know what they don't know and may think they have that opportunity or the right to consent. So just, you know now that they don't. And so even if they say, oh, I can sign it, just say, um, I, I, um, I won't have you sign it at this time. We'll wait till we get the, the legal guardian or the parent. The other thing you can do is you can say to DHHS caseworkers, you can check this with your lawyer because I've worked with my colleagues in the AG's office so that all of the AEGs who represent child protective workers like Courtney, they all get training annually and included in that training is supporting their caseworkers to know what they can and can't do under IDEA. So we work together on my end to make sure that they're appropriately supported when these questions come up. Like Roberta said, there are a lot of new people. There's a lot of turnover. So they honestly might not know. But if they ask the question, there are people who represent them who are prepared to help them with the answer. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting confused. So from the standpoint of somebody who's licensed as an LCSW, 
um, who also is under HIPAA, DHHS, when they have taken a child away from the parents and placed them in foster care, DHHS is usually seen as the agent of um, authority or who, who can give permission in the mental health world. Um, they cannot so give permission for IDEA related services. DHHS can give permission for medical treatment and medical services. But if the question is whether or not social work is going to be a related service on the IEP, the only person that can give consent for that is a parent under IDEA, and that parent can't be a DHHS worker. Even if they say, well, I'm also the legal guardian because the child is like they have been removed from the home. I've had a DHS worker tell me that they are the legal guardian. So they would be the one to sign the authorization forms and so forth. Nope. So that's not correct? Not correct. They are the legal guardian, but IDEA is specific that no public agency can play the role of a parent. So do we need, if we have an LCSW, do we need a parent consent to talk to DHHS? No. Okay. No, no. If the child, I'm assuming that DHHS is involved with the child, that there's a DHHS caseworker, right? <coughs> Excuse sorry, me. Abigail, what? I'm looking at you. I assume you're looking at me, but like, we're yeah, no, sorry. Here. So, you know, so I'm, I'm, when DHHS is, what's the legal standing that D, is there some kind of landmark, um, word or time when DHHS is, is become not just examining the situation or sending a worker into look, but when they when they open it, is it after like the first Jeopardy hearing? Is there some kind of marker where DHHS becomes more involved? So I am not a huge DHHS expert, trust me, but when a court orders a child placed in DHHS custody, that's an important marker because at that point, DHHS is legally responsible for the child in the same way that prior to being placed in DHHS custody, a parent would be considered responsible for the child. But Congress, knowing that that's how child protection works, wanted to make sure that when it comes to a child's rights under IDEA to either early intervention services or FAPE, that no government official, like an employee of DHHS, could make the decisions that the child's parent, whether biological or adoptive, would have made before they were taken into state custody. So what happens is the government, through in Maine, the Department of Education appoints a surrogate parent who will not be a state employee to exercise the rights with respect to IDEA that would belong to a parent. I don't know if Roberta, you wanna say anything more about the surrogate parent program? Um, no, just that we do have um, a, a department within Aaron's uh, side, the five to tw uh, 22 um, person uh, who's overseas a surrogate parent and they uh, appoint them out of out of the other side of IDEA. Right. I get the feeling that there's not always a surrogate parent easily found or identifiable. I, having been working when I was working in schools, I was asked to be a surrogate parent. So because so for the okay, can few I just of us pause you, Abigail, this is an important point. Super important point. If any of you ever feel like you're in a situation where you ask who is authorized to give consent or who is the surrogate parent and you don't get a satisfactory answer, you need to contact Roberta immediately. Bring your site director into the loop, but a call goes to Roberta immediately. We have the ability the magic we. We have the ability to get someone in position to do that. ASAP, 
but we have to know there's a problem. And just to be clear, if that person, if you're right, Abigail, that person isn't in the loop and doing what they're supposed to be doing, then everything CDS does can all be challenged because none of it is in compliance with IDEA. So it's super important if you can't get an answer to who has the rights of the parent to give consent and to participate in this process, or if what you're told is it's the DHHS caseworker, site director, Roberta, immediately. So Sarah, um, again, foster parent versus surrogate, surrogate parent. Okay. In Maine, foster parents are automatically the de facto surrogate parent. So if a child is placed in foster care, that person, person or persons, don't need a specific appointment from the department to serve as the surrogate parent. Thanks, Roberta. That's an important thing to know. But, but the foster parent has to know that. In other words, you might run into a situation where it hasn't been made clear to the foster parent that that's among their obligations and duties, or either the foster parent or DHHS might have specific reasons why they would prefer that the foster parent not be the surrogate parent. So it's still a question worth asking. And I know out in the sphere here, there are a bunch of case managers. Please, please, please have on your tick lists, make sure you're clear who is the parent. And, Did you have right. something else you wanted to ask? I sort of cut you off a little bit because I wanted to follow through with that thread to make sure that everyone knew what the statewide expectation was in terms of if you don't know who the parent is. Oh, no, I'm all set. Thank well, I'm not all set, but I, I will. <laughs> I, have, I have a ton more questions now, but I this I don't think this is the forum for me no. to take everybody's time. But thank you. I'll, I'll okay, make sure and you can always answers. with your site director talk to Roberta. If I need to get involved, I'll get involved. I mean, we'll get you all the answers to your questions. Yep. So, yeah, but, forward those. Yeah, forward those all. And I know um, I see Ashley's uh, question or comment in the in the in the chat box, and she's absolutely right. Again, not all DHHS case managers or workers um, know what they don't know, and so. You want and you want to be the informer of that, but you um, and absolutely can tell them that they can go back and check to see who is um, has the parental rights if they are unsure or unclear. Right. I mean, you don't have to be you're sort of on the front line of it, but you don't have to be the person that pursues this. Your site director can work with the state office. They can work with me. The DHS people will work with their lawyers. In other words, there are an abundance of people who can tell them what their role is and what their role isn't. It doesn't have to be you. Okay, let me talk about a couple of more FERPA IDEA issues. FERPA does not prevent disclosure of records or of PII from records without consent in order to secure a provider or a placement. That falls under the exception for seeks or intends to enroll. CDS has a long tradition of getting consent forms for every individual provider that's going to serve a student. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing unlawful with that. All I'm pointing out is that it's not required under FERPA because disclosing information to a potential provider or a potential placement in order to determine if they're the right person, are they able to serve the child, et cetera, that is within your right as the agency, the education agency, looking for an appropriate contractor to provide educational services. Finally, a question about timelines. Remember a few minutes ago, all right, why are there two S's on timelines? Anyway, um, a few minutes ago, I talked about how FERPA requires 
that you need to produce records within a reasonable time period, generally considered to be less than 45 days. Under IDEA, you need to disclose records prior to an IEP team meeting at which they will be discussed. In other words, under IDEA, you have a stricter compliance than FERPA. Under IDEA, you can have a complaint investigation or a due process hearing that won't address FERPA violations, but will address any potential violations of IDEA with respect to records. So for example, if a parent complains that they went to IEP team meeting and for the first time they saw a bunch of evaluations and they had asked the school for all of the evaluations that were going to be discussed, that's a problem under IDEA because the records weren't produced before the IEP team meeting at which they were going to be discussed. It may well still be within the 45-day period under FERPA. Okay, a couple of other records issues. First of all, FERPA is not a record retention statute. In other words, you can't violate FERPA by not having a record that the parent very much thinks you should have. That's not what FERPA is about. FERPA is about producing what you do have. IDA. CDS needs to maintain appropriate records supporting child find, evaluation, eligibility determination, development of the IFSP or IEP, and compliance with the procedural safeguards. That's because the absence of those records could cost you or could make a finding or a violation in either a complaint investigation or a due process hearing. In other words, you're keeping those records in order to defend CDS's compliance with IDEA. So while FERPA doesn't have any retention requirements, I would argue that IDEA does because you need to have the records necessary to show either the department in a complaint investigation or in routine monitoring or a hearing officer in a due process hearing that you have complied with IDEA. All right, you all have been fantastic in that you've been doing Zoom after Zoom after Zoom. But before we go, and you know, you can all have your iced coffee like Fape Cat, what questions do you have for me? I have a question. This is Judy Smith, um, speech pathologist. Often I send things to families' homes, and I'm just wondering about the return address. Should I simply have my name and not my title? and just the address of the Arundel site and not actually write CDS for um, HIPAA purposes. Wow. <laughs> I can tell you, Judy, that I've done this work for 22 years and no one has ever asked me about using envelopes that designate that the communication is from CDS. I have never... All right, how do I say this? I have never seen a decision that suggests that sending items in an envelope from an education agency violates either FERPA or IDEA. In other words, I can tell you this because <laughs> my next door neighbor never picks up her mail. And as a result, the post office gets sick and tired of trying to stuff mail in her mailbox, and their solution is to stuff it in mine. <laughs> Putting aside for a moment that this is not, I am certain, approved post office procedure, I raise that here only because I know, I feel like I know every single time the Brunswick School Department is trying to reach out to her about her child. I am not an expert in HIPAA but you are governed for CDS purposes, not by HIPAA, but by FERPA. 
And I would say you were just fine under FERPA using a CDS envelope or an envelope where the return address indicates that it is from CDS. Okay, thank you. And if you'd tell the post office to stop delivering my next door neighbor's mail <laughs> to my mailbox, that that's not considered delivery anyway. No, I get my neighbor's mail all the time, so I can't help you with that one. <laughs> oh, dear. Erin Frazier has her hand up. Hey. <laughs> I do. Um, and I don't really want to confuse anyone here, but I just wonder if you might talk a little bit. This happens a lot in my work in public schools where people feel like they can't give any information to um, adults who are working with a child about their disability status because of FERPA. So they confuse the records and, and the PII confidentiality with people who might interact and work with children with disabilities. So I'm wondering if you could just speak a little bit to that just for people to understand um, some of the nuances. So Aaron, you're essentially talking about who's a school official, right? So one of these- And in CDS, that's confusing because we have a lot of different private entities that we yes. work with. Right. Yes. So I totally agree. It's more confusing in CDS land than it is in typical public school land because you use a lot of contractors and people who are not literally sitting next to you or in the classroom next to you. Under the exception for school officials that have a need to know, that includes everyone, whether a CDS employee or a contractor, that is part of making the child's IEP come to life and work. And so you need to be communicating with people at the educational placement that's been selected for the child. You need to be communicating with the people who will transport the child from their home to the educational placement and back. In other words, anyone who over the, in the course of the day would have a reason to be interacting with the child and would need to know in order for those interactions to be successful about either something about the child's disability, everything about the child's disability. In other words, you always temper your response by giving the least amount of information that's appropriate, but you definitely under FERPA have the authority to tell all of the adults, what if there are volunteers at the preschool? Well, the volunteers may need to know things about the student's disability. That is all okay under FERPA, even without the parent's consent. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Lisa has her hand up, and then we have two questions in the chat box. So I just want to make sure that we don't overlook those. Hi, Hi Lisa. Ahead, Lisa. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm just starting with CDS now. This is my first day. So wow. Uh, yeah. What a start. You learned about going to court and that you have a lawyer that talks a lot. It right? was so relaxing. Ah, but um, I, my question is, I'll be working in uh, some daycare centers, so they're not um, school settings. Am I also allowed to discuss the child's um, occupational therapy goals with the staff at a daycare center? Is the child, are you talking about part C? Is that why you're in daycare centers? Uh, maybe Kelly Weber could answer that. I, I don't know the answer to that, but. So here's why I'm asking that question. Yeah, Sarah, I'm just going to say that we are in daycare centers because that's where some of our children are, are placed, right? So they may be four, but they're not in public pre-Ks. Their town may not have it. So they are in an all day, uh, childcare that may still run some type of yep. preschool Got curriculum. Got it, Kelly. Thanks. Thank you. So if they are there because they've been placed there to receive their FAPE, like Kelly just described, then you absolutely treat them as a school. Okay. In other words, school for your folks isn't going to look like a school for a 16-year-old. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So the first question in the chat box there is, can you touch on a little on the teacher records that are teacher possession, like grade books, personal notes, uh, email records, and are they are they releasable to parents under FERPA? In other words, you know, a personal record of some sort. 
So the personal record exception under FERPA is for a teacher's notes that no one sees other than the teacher and someone who might be brought in to cover for them. Okay. I've never been a teacher. So I'm describing this in the best way I know how. I'm told by those who are teachers that good teachers will keep notes about specific students and their IEPs. And those notes are left for a substitute teacher. That is not disclosed under FERPA. If those records are made available to anyone else, if they bring them to IEP team, they've lost the protection. So that's what the personal record exception is. Now let's talk about email. My understanding is that CDS uses email with parent consent as a way to do scheduling, as a way to confirm appointments, as a way to even exchange documents. Those emails meet the definition of a public record, uh, of a education record, right? Because they're about a specific student and they're maintained by CDS. And how do you know that they're maintained by CDS? Because you all have main.gov emails. And you know what main.gov does? Saves emails. Any other questions about the very narrow exception, very narrow for personal records from teachers and other folks who are direct service providers? Okay, can I ask a quick question? I hope it's quick. Sure. Um, so HIPAA says that LCSW records are, should be confidential and double locked. And FERPA is the protection of educational records. And as an itinerant social worker traveling from site to site without an endemic memory, um, how do I carry information and abide by the regulations? Under FERPA, uh, it, sorry, is what you're asking can you put your records in your briefcase and carry them from site to site? Or can you put your records in the equivalent of an electronic briefcase, like a computer, and have it with you? Yeah, electronic briefcases, are, are uh, that's problematic because I know it's, it's password protected, but it can be problematic to access that in a, you know, from on the road from site to site. So I guess I'm, I'm asking about written materials. Nothing in FERPA prevents you from moving your materials from site to site in the same way 